there's still sort of this perception that Bitcoin kind of came out of nowhere. Yes. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto just descended from the heavens and dropped Bitcoin in the world and uh, th then it existed. So the Genesis book tells sort of the origin story of Bitcoin. Yeah, so the only way to achieve monetary reform is to create something the government can stop. That's what Bitcoin is. Welcome to our very first episode of the Cypherpunk Podcast, where we talk about freedom and privacy-preserving technologies. I'm here with our very first guest, Aaron Van Weerdum. He is an OG editor for the Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, he's a co-host of the Bitcoin Explained Podcast. And most importantly, for our purposes, he is the author of the Genesis book, which discusses all the cryptographic and privacy technologies uh, and economics and game theory that lead up to the creation of Bitcoin. So with that being said, welcome, Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Manny. Honored to be your first guest. Awesome. So um, I read your book. It's fantastic. Thank um, you. You know, you did such a great job. And I have a lot of questions and uh, a lot of rabbit holes we're going to go down. <laughs> so uh, guys, strap in because this is going to be um, a long series. <laughs> let's go. So let's start in uh, chapter one where uh, chapter one is called spontaneous order. Um, and we can talk about a little bit more about what spontaneous order is later. But uh, let's just start off with like with like World War One and the hyperinflation that occurred during World War One, why and after World War One, and why that occurred um, and the introduction of Austrian economics. Mm hmm. Yeah, so, well, first, maybe quickly about the book, you already mentioned this, but so the Genesis book tells the, sort of the origin story of Bitcoin. So um, there's still sort of this perception that Bitcoin kind of came out of nowhere. Yes. You know, Satoshi Nakamoto just uh, uh, descended from the heavens and dropped Bitcoin in the world and uh, then it existed. But really, there is a prehistory to it. There were people and projects that were trying to create digital cash. And Bitcoin is sort of an evolution in in their thought. So indeed, I start. Uh, so there's, there's kind of two tracks in the Genesis book. One of them is very focused on economics, and one of them is very focused on uh, tech. And then throughout the book, they start to merge, and it becomes one. So it starts as two stories, and then becomes mm -hmm. one story towards the end. So indeed, uh, one side of the book to 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 explain that way starts with economics, and specifically with. Austrian economics. That's sort of the first building block I lay. Mm -hmm. So what is Austrian economics? So um, the the field of economics was sort of invented uh, by Adam Smith. Uh, and he was a free market economist. He believed that free markets were the best way to kind of organize, you know, society, the world, the, the, the economy. Um, it, through specialization, for example, like if you have private ownership, then people can specialize in a specific craft, and that's how everyone uh, gets wealthier. So he wrote The Wealth of Nations. Uh, but then after that, the field of economics was sort of overtaken by what is called the historical school of economics. And they kind of refuted the idea that there are economic laws. And really, you just have to sort of study it like you study history. Uh, you just sort of study what happened and you kind of document it, but you can't really mm -hmm. learn anything from it. And then Carl Menger, around 1870, he sort of reintroduced free market economics. So he said, no, we need to be able to learn something from this field, something we can apply in one way or another. And the main thing, his main insight was of subjective value. So until then the general idea was like, what is value, right? What is value? What, what, how, do we, how do you determine value? And up until that moment, <clears throat> the, most economists thought that value was best explained through the effort or the, um, yeah, the, the, the work you had to do to create something. It's kind of obvious in a way that, uh, you know, value is subjective, right? For individuals, um, you know, if you think about marketing as a concept in general, right? It's like, you can take something that, you know, is the exact same thing and you can market it and, uh, you know, put a brand on it um, and it becomes worth so much more to so many people. Uh, so, you know, it's not a stretch to, to to think about this concept of, you know, subjective value. Uh, yeah. The, the example I give in my book are shoes. Like why are shoes valuable? And economists thought for a long time they're valuable because they take effort to produce. It takes work to produce them. You know, it, it takes, uh, you know, maybe a day to produce a pair of shoes or a week, and that's why they have value. 
And then Menger, he kind of turned that idea upside down and he said, no, shoes are valuable because, well, he didn't use the example of shoes, I am, but he said shoes are valuable because people need shoes. It, 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 it fills a need that people have. They need to wear shoes. They like wearing shoes, so it's more subjective. Now, a better example maybe is, let's say, and this is the marginal utility you, uh, point you made or you brought up, is let's say you're in the desert. Mm. You're in the desert, it's <laughs> warm, it's uh, dry, um, you, and you still got, uh, you know, a couple of days to walk before you reach, uh, you know, a, a city where you can drink water. So you're thirsty. Now someone offers you a bottle of water and, you know, you're, you're starving of thirst. How much are you willing to pay for that bottle of water? A lot. A lot. Like it's worth everything to you. It's worth your life. So you would, you know, you would potentially be willing to give everything you have in exchange for that bottle of water. We see this in natural disasters too. If there's a hurricane or mm. something, you know, power goes out, you know, people all of a sudden, right. people that have means are, are willing to just pay a lot more for something to signal to the market, hey, right. we need this here now. Right, exactly. So you, <laughs> you buy this bottle of water with everything you have. Or let's say with a lot you have. It's worth a lot to you. Now, now you have that bottle of water. Now someone offers you a second bottle of water. How much are you going to offer for this bottle of water? Probably a little bit less. Probably less, right? Yeah. Like you're not that thirsty anymore. You just had a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. So now you're kind of fine for now. But let's say you buy that bottle of water again. And then you buy another. Let's say you now have 10 bottles, bottles of water. Yeah. How much are you going to pay for the 11th? Well, maybe not a lot. Of, uh, you yeah. know, now you're not thirsty. You got, you've got enough to make it to the city. You don't need the water. So now that water is not worth that much to you anymore. So you can see that the same bottle of water has a different value to the same person even mm -hmm. at different points in time. Yeah. So there's no objective value to a bottle of water. It's a subjective thing. Absolutely. And similarly, like people have uh, different tastes, for example, right? Like... Um, what's your favorite type of nut? Macadamia, probably. Macadamia. So my favorite type of nut is pistachio. Yeah. So <laughs> I would probably be willing to pay more for pistachio than you, and you would be willing to pay more for macadamia. Yeah. Is that how you even pronounce that? Yeah. <laughs> then, that then I would. So we have different, you know, we value things differently. Mm -hmm. So, so he, he really turned the field of economics on its head in that way. He said, no, value is not something objective based on how yeah. much effort it costs to produce no it is something that's just in, one input maybe you know of the whole equation uh potentially but but menger said no it's ultimately subjective so it's ultimately people that that value something and that's where value comes from yeah and then from from there you can start to argue <laughs> or, or you can start to think so this is what austrian economics starts to do is okay you you start from this starting principle so then how does the economy work best? How does it best operate? So now let's say, well, we can stick to the nuts example. Uh, you're a farmer, for example, uh, and you, you can decide, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to produce nuts. So what nuts are you going to produce? Are you going to produce pistachios or are you going to produce macadamia nuts? Well, it depends on what other people want, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on what other people are essentially willing to pay for not so if there's many people like me that like pistachios then there's more demand for pistachios and we're willing to pay for that so it sort of drives up the price of pistachios and then a farmer will know ha huh, if i make pistachio if i produce pistachios that's actually a more profitable way to run a business than if i produce macadamia nuts so through that sort of price system through the through the demand the subjective demand that people have for nuts that's how a farmer will decide what he what he produces so that's that's in a nutshell. Ah, in a no nutshell, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> that's in a nutshell, sort of the the cornerstone that Menger laid for um, yeah the field of economics. Like that's sort of the right way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the nice things about this is it sort of it, it explains why trade happens at all. Like why do people trade things? Well, it's because they they value things differently. If I let let's let's keep money out of the if out of the equation for now. Let's say I have a bag of macadamia nuts and you have a bag of pistachios. Well, I would be happier subjectively if I have the pistachios and you would be happier if you have the macadamia nuts. Mm -hmm. So we can decide to trade our nuts. Yeah. And then trade happens and then value is created through trade. Now we're both happier because we, we subjectively both improved our well-being, so to say. So it, it, it explains why trade happens and why 
trade creates value. Why the free market is a, you know, value creating system essentially. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, whereas other economic schools of thought try to create a model or something that says this is what it is, right? Um, and in, in my background is statistics, and we have a, an expression that goes, um, you know, every model is eventually wrong, but some are useful, right? Um, so Menger's response is kind of like. There are so many inputs, you know, people's preferences, individuals. There is no way to just create a like a model that's just going to explain all this, right? Because, you know, you might want some, you know, you might prefer pistachios, but you woke up today and you feel like having some macadamia nuts, right? But you prefer pistachios. And then, you know, six months later, you just might get sick of eating all nuts altogether, right? So you're, so there's all these inputs and things. It's impossible to model all this. That's, is, did I explain that correctly? That's the way I kind of understood it. Yeah, uh, more or less. So here we sort of make a jump to Mises specifically. Uh -huh. um, so, so Mises, he, uh, he, he had a critique on socialism. Mm -hmm. So socialism, we're now around the start of the 20th century, mm -hmm. ar around that time. And um, socialism was becoming more popular uh, around the world. And of course, especially in uh, you know the Soviet Union, for example, where the socialists in 1917 took control. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there, were there were different critiques on socialism. So one of the critiques was if you just disperse all economic productivity across society instead of you know having private ownership and the, and the, the, the people that that produce it get gain the the, the spoils of, of of their work if you just disperse it across society then there's no real incentive to work in the first place of like course. why why would you it's getting your share and if you work harder you don't get the reward for that yeah uh, well, this is just he, human nature i mean you know we've seen it play out over and over right in history and he also, and there was also the critique that uh, the only way to sort of do socialism is to put someone in charge. So someone has to be in charge. Someone has to sort of plan the economy. It's like economic planning. So someone is going to say, we're going to produce this many pistachio nuts and this many macadamia nuts. Like that, that you know, that's an uh, essential part of socialism. And, um, but the, the planners could sort of abuse the system. And again, we've seen this it's happen awesome. a lot, of course. Yeah. They could abuse the system and kind of just take for themselves rather than fairly distributing it or, you know, fairly in air quotes here because mm -hmm. he, socialism arguably isn't fair at all. Yeah. But <clears throat> they could just take it for themselves rather than having a fair economy. But Mises said, Mises had a different critique. He said, even if people are incentivized to work or motivated to work, and even if the people in charge of a socialist system are honest and not not selfish, then it still wouldn't work. Why? Because the people in charge, the central planners, they don't have the economy. They don't, sorry, they don't have the information that exists throughout the economy. Mm -hmm. So indeed, all these personal tastes, you know, do I like pistachios or do you, do I like macadamia nuts? All these personal tastes, these in, exist throughout society. They All of exist. these tiny little inputs from yes. every individual, right? The idea I, of individuals kind of making up their mind or changing their mind or today they want this or today. There's no way for a central planner to know all of that at the same time, right? Or else they'd just be omnipotent. Exactly. So um, th this information is dispersed and therefore central planning doesn't work. You need to let this information the, this dispersed information sort of do its work. And that, that's what a free market allows. So through, through trade, as I explained five minutes ago, uh -huh. you, get, um, you, you get all these different inputs and all this different information that allows everyone in the economy to function. So mm -hmm. the farmers know, hey, if I produce pistachios, I make more money. The store owners know, hey, I need to sell pistachios. They, they tell the farmers, hey, there's mm -hmm. demand for pistachios here, so I want to... I mean, you don't even have to tell the pharmacist. They just say, I want to buy pistachios because, the, you know, the store owner knows what the demand is. So this information for every business, for every company, for every producer, it's sort of this information is decentralized and they know what's sort of best in their niche in the market. Uh -huh. So if you let, if you allow them to operate in their best self-interest, mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants to make money. If you allow them to operate in their best self-interest, it best serves all these subjective preferences. Then everyone gets the most, so to say. So that was Mises, his, his critique on socialism. Uh -huh. It doesn't work because central planning doesn't work. And this idea, if I remember correctly, it's called economic calculation, right? Socialism, mm -hmm. communism, it doesn't take into account this concept of economic calculation. Yes, correct. This is the <laughs> economic calculation problem that Mises describes. Yep. Um, and without economic calculation, it, it's very hard to have a successful economy, right? Because 
like we like we discussed, you know, it's impossible for any central planner to know everyone's preferences, ideas, um, you know, how their preferences change every day from day to day. Just and prices themselves are the best decentralized manner to communicate all of these things to the market, right? Because yes, um, and that you know nobody, all these individuals don't have to actually know why something's happening, but this idea of a changing price can can give them enough information where they can you know, adjust their preferences or, um, you know, adjust what they're selling or what they're doing. It's just, it, and it's a, it's a way for this whole free market to communicate to each other in this just giant decentralized fashion. Yeah. So, yeah. So the prices aspect of that specifically, <clears throat> that's uh, Friedrich Hayek's input. Mm -hmm. So Friedrich Hayek, that he's one of the main characters in the Genesis book, mm -hmm. like his ideas, and we'll get to that later yeah. as well, on money are very influential on, uh -huh. on Bitcoin and the people that uh, developed digital cash systems. Mm -hmm. And he indeed said that prices specifically are the way for the free market to communicate, to communicate value. So the example I use in my book is uh, steel. I, I, like say, um, uh, I use sort of, to, you know, I, I paint this picture of sort of a simplified economy, of course. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there, there's a car producer, there's cars, there's someone who's selling the cars, and there's also a kitchen producer and someone who's selling kitchen mm -hmm. equipment. And they both need steel. So there's there's a steel producer out there. And um, who's he going to, you know, sell the steel to? Well, he's going to sell the steel to whoever is offering the most money, you know, so that's embedded in the price. Now, who's going to offer the most money? It's where the demand is the highest. Mm -hmm. So is there more demand for new cars or is there more demand for new kitchen equipment? So this is subjective. It's uh -huh. people have a subjective preference for what they want. They bid up the price for uh, whatever it is they want. Uh, this is, is communicated through prices, and then just the, the 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 people that are producing either the cars or the kitchen equipment, they then you know use this information to themselves bid for steel, and that's how the steel producer knows where the steel should go. It's whoever has the highest uh, demand, and if if this changes over time, so for a while people want cars, and, la and later people want kitchen equipment then this demand shifts. So now the price for kitchen equipment is higher. Mm -hmm. They're offering more for the steel. <clears throat> and then the steel producer knows, okay, the steel no longer goes to the car manufacturer. It now goes to the kitchen equipment. So as the economy changes, as people's preferences changes, the prices of goods and services change accordingly. Mm -hmm. And that's how everyone knows where, that, that's how yeah. resources are distributed throughout the economy in an optimal so way and it factors that can influence these things right you know, right just whether it could be like climate or weather or you know um i know it's like ice cream sales go up during the hotter months of the year right so there's all of these different factors that it's it's very hard to you know i know the central planners the socialists the communists you know they think they can just do all this but um it's just how however nice it sounds it's just so impossible Right. The reality is it's not possible because there's no way to model all these things. It's impossible to uh, add all these variables to the model to try to predict and change. Right. The, the only way, the best way we have is by using prices in the market from individuals, you know, changing their preferences or adjusting or wanting something more than they usually do. Or, um, you know, that's the best that's the best way we've got. And I think that uh, we really hit on that in this book really talk a lot about that right yeah it's the most efficient way to allocate allocate resources throughout the economy and that's so this is what <laughs> hayek described as spontaneous order so spontaneous order as opposed to um yeah, central planning spontaneous order it it sort of emerges from society so there's no one mm -hmm. that's uh you, you know designing the economy top down like uh, rather it's it's this bottom up Decentralized where, organism yes. of, of interactions between, you know, millions of participants, individuals with their own preferences, with, you know, outside inputs from, you know, weather to temperature to all these different things that can just affect things, right? A hurricane comes through, that changes the spontaneous order of that area, right? Right. Um, you know, and you cannot centrally plan, you know, those types of things, right? And um, Well, yeah, a good example of that is, let's say there's a steel producer and indeed a hurricane comes in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it destroys the, the factory. So now that steel producer can't produce steel anymore. So now there's less steel. But the demand for steel didn't change. Mm -hmm. So there's you know lower supply, more demand. So now the price of steel goes up. Now another steel producer in a, in a different city 
he sees this, he sees the price of steel is going up. That's interesting. I like making money. You know what? I'm going to ramp up production now. Mm -hmm. So again, as, 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 as things in the economy change, as society change, the price system sort of makes sure that the al allocation of resources remains optimal. It can adjust to whatever's happening rather than a central planner that has to sort of really keep all of this in account and sort of figure out or guess what people want and, um, you know, order that, that factory to produce more as, you know, that type of stuff that was happening in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. rather than this top-down approach, Hayek and before him Mises, they argued, no, the top-down, the bottom-up way is more effective. It is a more efficient way of allocating resources. Yeah, and I think this is just, this is just the reality of the situation, right? So however much you'd want socialism or communism to work because it sounds so great, you know, and if you think about it, it really does. It sounds nice. Okay, we can all help each other do all these things. But the reality of the, the harsh reality of the situation is it just doesn't work, right? And there's so many reasons why. Um, and, you know, a free market, it truly does work. And this spontaneous order is really the reason why. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that, that it, it, that it sounds nice. And because yeah. th that is... True, I, I think so as well. Like it sounds nice in principle. Exactly. And also Hayek specifically, he wrote uh, he wrote about these issues for kind of his socialist friends almost. Mm -hmm. Like he was working in universities at the time in England and a lot of his colleagues were warming up to the idea of socialism. Uh -huh. And he didn't see them as like evil or ill-intentioned or anything like that. He just thought they were mistaken. Like it sounds nice, but they yeah. don't understand why it doesn't work. Exactly. So that's why he took the effort to uh, you know explain why why it doesn't work in his in his uh, books. So let's take let's uh, let's pull on that thread a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about Hayek because I learned a lot in your book about him. And then we can come back and talk a little bit more about uh, spontaneous order through time and uh, yeah, go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't know that Friedrich Hayek was actually uh, participated. He was part of World War One, I, I guess. I did not know that. He, he fought. Yeah, he fought in the, on the Austrian-Hungarian side uh -huh. uh, as an airplane spotter or something. Yeah, the last year. He was born in 1899, I believe. So for the first three years of the war, which was from 1914 until 1918, of course. First three years, he was uh, too young still. But then uh, at his 18th birthday, he was drafted. And the last year he spent uh, in World War I. And it's really his experience there, uh, you know, witnessing all the, uh, all, 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 all the, you know, awful fatalities and uh, how it destroyed just the entire continent, basically. It was his personal experience that made him decide to study economics basically well not just economics but also politics and he he it became sort of his mission to figure out how to organize society to prevent these kinds of wars in the future mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh in your opinion um i know we've we've talked about this but what are your thoughts about world war one how how and why it happened because i think this is a big part of a lot of the destruction that came after the hyperinflation of the austrian krona and the uh, German uh, mark. Let's talk a little bit about that. Why World War One uh, happened in itself? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, nationalism was a big part of it. So at that time, nationalism was a, a very popular ideology. I mean, it 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 still is, uh, at least in some parts of the world, more than others. But at that time, it was definitely a very um, yeah. People were very proud to be part of a nation, and really going to war was not necessarily seen as something bad. It was sort of seen as something that's good. But um, I mean, to go into the full details of what led to World War I, uh, ultimately, I think it's about, it was about resources, right? It was about, it was just an unstable situation. Um, and uh, yeah, it was ultimately, I would say, war, war on uh, about land and resources, mm -hmm. like m most wars in history. So let me, uh, but but definitely fueled by the sense of nationalism that okay. existed, that, especially throughout Europe. So from uh, as an American, mm -hmm. you know, studying it, and I remember being in, I think it was New Orleans, and just going to a World War One museum, and looking at the public uh, citizenry at the time, like the consensus of did we want to go to World War One? 
you know, when did that sort of shift and change? And uh, from what I saw, you know, the public, the American public was largely against entering this war, mm-hmm. you know, like 90 plus percent against it, at least the beginning, you know, we should not get involved in this war. I don't know if the ever pub- if the public consensus ever switched where the majority of the population thought we should participate in World War One. What do you think allowed the United States to get involved in World War One? Um, well, I think what you're getting to is the the establishment of the Federal Reserve, Correct. and that's you know essentially printing money gave countries, including the United States, the uh-huh. the, the the room to actually fight a war. You know, uh-huh. fighting a war is obviously very expensive. Taxing the population is very unpopular, so the easy way to tax a war or to fund a war, I should say, is by you know, controlling the money and being able to print more money. Precisely. That, I think that's what you're getting at, yeah, right? Yeah, that's kind yeah. of what I'm getting at. Um, you know, f- from looking at it, it, it was no coincidence that um, in 1913, you know, they kind of debased the uh, the gold window where, you know, they, they basically said that the dollar is now worth, you know, you get half as much gold if you turn in your dollars, right? So they, they changed that. They established the Federal Reserve and they were essentially able to double the money supply to to finance quickly this war to get involved, right? And the public was largely against this at the time from from all the records and everything I've looked at, right? Um, so <clears throat> just kind of wanted to, to throw that out there. And uh, post- Yeah, just in general, I mean, it's very hard to fight a war if you can't print money. Exactly. It, it, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but <laughs> historically it's happened a lot. And it, <clears throat> Uh, well, especially if the countries you're fighting wars with are across the world. If they, well, no, if they are doing it, yeah. if they are printing money to fund the war, uh, which essentially means you know you're taking resources from the economy, you're you're sort of extracting value from the economy in an indirect way, ra- rather than a direct tax. You're mm-hmm. printing war to devalue currency. Uh, that is a very effective way of fighting a war. And if mm-hmm. other countries that you're fighting with are doing it, then you know, you, you're at a very steep disadvantage if you don't do it yourself. So there's a sort of... Um, a game theoretical. Yes, exactly. There's a perverse sort of game theory going on there, which, you know, is enabled by having different countries having their own fiat currencies, and they can all sort of decide to print money individually, then, you know, you you kind of have to join as well. No, you're not wrong. That's an interesting uh, thought there. Hmm. Interesting. So post-World War One. How important was it that, um, and it, I think it is interesting that we see the, uh, the the Austrian economic school emerge from from that area, right? Where uh, in, in Austria, and uh, because they were they suffered after World War One, they were the losers of the war. So let's talk a little bit about that hyperinflation and what happened and how they tried to, you know, pay off the debts and this. The, yeah, the loser of the war, obviously, they, they, you know, they the boot was sort of put on their necks after that war. Um, they really had to essentially pay everybody back or whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so they did that in large part by printing more money okay. as well. Yeah, so Austria, but also Germany, obviously, famously, they, they went into hyperinflation mm-hmm. after the war, and it had a lot to do with the outcome of the war. So, yeah, the population suffered for that severely. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's... I, I mean, that's not why Austrian economics emerged in Austria, though, because Austrian economics emerged before the war, right? Okay. Like, Menger was 1870 that he published oh. his book. But... I mean, it seems... You talked in your book a lot about, like, you know, that Austrian economics was, like, a de facto band, almost, in those areas, like... Yeah, that's right. So it was, like, it emerged earlier, but it didn't really come to prominence, at least from my studies, until uh, Ludwig von Mises and, uh, you know, uh, Frederick Hayek came about and uh, really... Yeah, so so when when uh, Menger published his uh, his Principles work, which I'm not gonna try to pronounce because Principles that's of it. Economics, right? Principles of Economica. Uh, yeah. yeah, I guess so. I was thinking of the German title Grundslage <laughs> Economics. <laughs> uh, I believe. Uh, Volk Well done, well done. <laughs> I don't know if I said that right. Um, yeah, so that that really unleashed a debate within, especially German speaking universities, about the field of economics. So it became. You know, uh, in in Vienna, so in Austria, mm-hmm. it caught on. It was popular, his ideas. Uh, but in Germany, which at that time was still a relatively new country, mm-hmm. um, the, it, the, it, it didn't catch on at all. And indeed, it was almost banned. So, Or it was banned. It was yeah. the, the German universities did not adopt this way of thinking. Mm-hmm. 
Well, in Vienna, they did. And that's why it's called Austrian economics. It's sort of a different way of thinking about economics, so uh -huh. Austrian economics. So even now, you know, Austrian economics has obviously spread way further than Austria. It's pretty po popular in the United States, most notably these days. Um, but it's still called Austrian economics. You no, know, it's so interesting because in your book, you mentioned that that was almost like an insult. Like, yeah. You know, you know, oh, the Austrian school or whatever, like it for, you know, that, that was the intention. Yeah, it was kind of a way to say insult. fake economics or yeah. something. It's like it was meant to be an insult, but it was adopted and uh, caught on. It, it's sort of like um, maximalism. Bitcoin maximalism was originally intended to be maybe not an insult, but definitely not a positive thing. But because Vitalik Buterin came up with the term, right? But then big maximalists just sort of adopted it and say, yeah, we're maximalists. So it's kind of like that with Austrian economics. All right, let's go back to this concept of spontaneous order. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about, you know, you can describe it again real quick for, for our listeners. And then uh, we can talk about this idea of spontaneous order across, you know, time and different places. Yeah. So, I mean, in short, spontaneous order, as I mentioned, is a bottom up way of organizing the economy. So you could also say it's a uh, not organizing the economy, but then it self organizes, like people through their subjective preference, they figure out what they want, and they communicate to that to each other with prices, no one is in charge, but it is still an effective way of allocating resources throughout the economy, in contrast to a more top down central planning type of style. Um, so yeah, this, what we just discussed is mostly spontaneous order through time, well, no, through space well we haven't discussed it either very much so we can sort of get into that so um the example i give in the genesis book is that because everything is factored in 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 a price the the place where something is produced is so what where do resources go to right how do you <clears throat> If something is, yep, yeah, how, how are you, okay, I, actually we did discuss this. So how do you decide where resources go, resources go to? That That's self-organized over space. But you can also self-organize over time. You can also have spontaneous order over time. Um, this was, uh, this concept was introduced by... Van Baum Bauwerk, I believe. Yes. Did I say it right? Yeah, 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 you said it. Talk to me a little bit about him. Uh, oh, I don't know a lot about him personally, or I don't know much of his backstory. I just know what what he contributed to uh, to to this way of thinking. So he argued that really interest rates are the way to organize to spontaneously organize over time. So the example I give is uh, let's say let's say we both want to buy a car, you and me. We both want to buy a car. Um, in general. If we want to buy a new car, we'd rather buy one sooner than later, right? If we have a new car sooner, we can drive it more. We can drive it sooner. Like we, we prefer to have a new car today over a car, a new car next year. Sure. So we value, you know, the same car more today than a year from now in, in that sense. But we may still differ in our time preference. So let's say uh, my car broke down and I have to, I have a job where I need to drive to every day while your car is still fine. And maybe you even work from home. So you just, you still like a new car, of course, but I really need a new car, yeah. right? So it, it, just yeah. like the water in the desert, the, I now have a stronger need for a new car than you. So I would value this new car more today compared to next year. Then you would there's a bigger difference between you know, how much we value this car so in a way you can see it as two different cars a car today and a car next year like they're sort of two different products in the market mm -hmm. it is in reality the same car but you can think of it as sort of today and next year as like two different cars almost um okay so i need a new car today i, I really value a new car today but i don't have the money Right, I I I I broke. I just, I'm broke. I just spend my money on other things. I don't have this money right now at hand, and you do. So usually you would say, or at first you would say, well, then Matty is getting a new car first <laughs> because Matty has the money, right? And I don't, even though I would prefer. I I have a stronger need for the car. You're uh -huh. getting the car because you have the money. Yeah. Well, that's actually not. 
technically true or not necessarily true. We can figure out another solution. Mm -hmm. Namely, I can borrow the money from you. So if I say, hey, Matty, I really need this car right now. Um, how about I give you a 10% interest rate and then I can buy the car today. And then oh, in a year from now, I'm giving you that money back and then you can buy a new car next year. Now, because I have st such a strong need for this car, I'm willing to pay this 10% extra. Mm -hmm. Well, for you, you don't have that strong a need for the new car. So for you, it's also nice. You can just wait a year, you already have a car, and then in a year, you have a car plus 10% extra. Yeah. So that's how that's what, how interest rates also uh, distribute resources throughout time. So who's getting the new car? You or me. I'm getting it, and you're getting the extra interest rate in that sense. So so interest uh, now and if you want to expand on that well so the point there is that interest uh interest rates are really the price of money itself mm -hmm. so everything in an economy has a price a t-shirt has a price a car has a price potatoes have a price and money has a price as well the price of money is the interest rate so the interest rate is a, a way of pricing money in that sense um so in the same way that prices help to allocate resources across space you know determining where the resources go determining yeah, if, spontaneous order and economic yes exactly it's so just like the it, economic calculation for money itself yes so with the interest <clears throat> rates we can also allocate resources over time so are you telling me that like for the most important good in society money we uh sent we use central planners to figure that out uh, yes exactly matty that's okay. uh, that's that's the point we're working towards so, uh, in a way so yeah the point is indeed that if you want to allocate resources over time then the most efficient way to do that is to let the free market figure out interest rates just like every other single good in society because we know that you know socialism and communism don't work exactly because there's no way to account for you know like my preference like maybe you know, maybe I would say if I only had to pay 2%, I would finance the car myself. But since you're giving me 10%, you know, I like that. And then maybe Paul over there would say, hey, I, you know, I'm at 6%, but if you pay me 12%. So there's, since there's no way for the Fed or whoever, the central planners of money to know all of those details at the same time, right. millions of people, right? Right, so, exactly. Yeah, okay. if you leave money and interest rates to the free market, Hayek argued, then you get the best allocation of resources over time. What a crazy mm -hmm. idea. That's what? so logical. You, uh, it sounds good, right? Wow, <laughs> sounds good. Okay. While if you manipulate interest rates, as the Federal Reserve or other central banks are doing, well, it distorts. It distorts that. It distorts um, when things are produced, or uh, the, it, it distorts the time preference of producers. For example, like um, th this is a little bit of a segue, but yeah, this was. Um, uh, how do we make this bridge? So. Hayek said, like, if, if you leave money to the free market, then you get an aggregate interest rate. And this actually helps producers to decide what they produce. Um, so if you are a producer, you can sort of do, you, you, you can invest in two ways. You, or, or you can either decide to invest in your company to be able to produce cheaper later on so you can build machines and stuff to to you know produce whatever it is you're producing or you can focus that that energy on now actually getting it on market so it, 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 there's different stages of production different stages of production. so there's an early stage of production and there's a late stage of production um and hayek said if you leave it to if you leave interest rates to the market it sort of signals to producer at which on which state they should uh, focus their resources uh, where, where they should invest their resources so if interest rates are low then it's better that that means that there's a lot of people that are willing to uh, delay their purchases they're more willing to invest their money to lend out their money and and delay their purchases and this money that they're lending out can be used by producers to invest for the long term, so to improve their production process. Then later on, when interest rates through the market, if people's demand increases and if they're less willing to invest and more willing to buy, consume, then interest rates will go up because there's uh, less 
uh, the supply of money. And now as interest rates are going up, it becomes more expensive for producers to borrow. So now they know, okay, now we just got to sell. So this works out very nicely. So people invest money, then producers can produce. And by the time that people get their money back, plus an interest rate, they can use it to actually purchase whatever these producers were producing. So there's sort of a natural way that the economy self organizes over time. <clears throat> While if you manipulate interest rates, these producers are getting the wrong signal. Mm -hmm. So they, if you if interest rates are artificially low, if they're low not because people are borrowing money or, or delaying their purchase or lending out money and delaying their purchase. They're just low because the central bank decided it. So now these producers are still in incentivized to increase their production process. But by the time they're ready to actually, you know, get it to market, the people don't have, you know, they weren't investing their money. So they don't, don't actually have the money to buy it. So because of that, there's not as much demand, there wouldn't be as much demand for the products as the producers thought, which means they have to sell at a lower price and their companies will suffer. And, you know, they, they, there will have to be layoffs and now people have even more or less money to spend and, you know, throughout the entire economy and it, go, it gets even worse. So by manipulating interest rates on the short term it sort of seems to work but in the long term the economy would be worse off because resources weren't distributed or allocated across time according to what were actual the subjective needs of people in a society so what you're saying is that interest rates facilitate spontaneous order across time Yes, That's exactly. Right. Well, if they are left to the free market. If they're left Ex to the free yes, market. Yes, exactly. exactly. That was Hayek's point. <laughs> but, you know, as we both know, this this is not the case, right? So um, let's talk about the Fed a little bit, right? The, uh, the Fed was created in 1913, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, but uh, obviously Hayek wasn't very happy about this. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he opposed this idea So the, for several reasons. So the Federal Reserve was originally implemented to avoid bank runs, essentially. Mm -hmm. So before that, there's a little bit nuance here, which I'm going to leave out for, for the sake of uh, mm -hmm. brevity. But um, yeah, you could, in a way, banks were just private banks. Now, of course, as we both know, banks operate on fractional reserves. This has been the case for you know a long time. So that means that uh, you know, people deposit their money in the bank and banks lend money out, but they're actually lending out more money than was deposited. So you're telling right. me that fractional reserve banking did exist before the Fed? It absolutely did, oh. yes. Yeah. Many people don't know that. They think that we need the Fed because that's the only way we can do fractional reserve banking. Well, I mean, so <clears throat> in, a, in a way it is. Well, that, so that was the idea, right? Of, this, is, this is where... Because I need to be care this is where I need to be careful to not get too lost in the nuance. But essentially banks operated on on a uh, fractional reserve. But the problem was if too many people wanted to withdraw their funds at the same time, then the bank eventually had said, "Well, we don't actually have that money, guys. So, uh, uh -huh. I guess I guess we're uh, bankrupt now and <laughs> you lost your money." Yeah. Uh, and you saw this happen a couple of times and then, you know, fear spread throughout the market. Like if there was, uh, even if it just started with a rumor, like this bank might not have enough money, then everyone wanted to not be the last to get their money out because yeah. then you lost your money. So everyone wants the to be game first. theory is, is perverse in that case. Yeah, exactly. So to prevent this, to prevent these bank runs, the federal reserve was installed as a lender of last resort. So if the bank had a liquidity liquidity crisis if they didn't have the means to pay everyone off they could you know ask the federal reserve for a loan so that's why uh, the federal reserve was installed however the federal reserve quite soon all sort of expanded its mandate <clears throat> um, what they started doing was not just act well I should mention, this is worth mentioning as well. So Hayek disagreed with this approach, essentially. He said this actually misaligns incentives. Moral hazard. Uh, moral hazard, exactly. So at least if private banks um, if, if private banks don't have this fallback mechanism, then private banks have a responsibility to you know not let it happen in the first place. So they would have to be careful uh to you know always have enough 
money in reserve in one way or another. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll quickly point out that so this concept of the, this is called free banking essentially where you have free banks and they have to just uh, take their own responsibility and their own you know manage their own business in however way they want uh this arguably wasn't really the case either because banks were heavily regulated already in all kinds of ways they they, yeah. they just didn't have a fallback mechanism like there was no federal reserve but there was still you know over regulated free banking proponents argue which is why it, it went wrong like they say if it was truly a free market if banks were truly completely free and it was really their own responsibility and they didn't have to deal with all these regulations mm -hmm. uh, then it would have probably worked but there were already regulations in place that limited and restricted all kinds of things and that that's why it, it went wrong anyways but then instead of giving the banks actually this responsibility and this power to just run their business how they wanted instead yeah. they implemented the federal reserve and they sort of increased regulation yeah i think we've seen um, that in so many different industries <laughs> so i was I mean, so surprised we, that that happened with yeah yeah i mean banking as well right um and a lot of these regulations they in my opinion they disrupt spontaneous order as well because they just cause so many different misalignments like right incentives. yes uh, so anyways, that's the argument free bankers made at that time, mm -hmm. or uh, now I would, uh, they, that's what free bankers argue about that time, I okay. should say. Um, what do you think? I, you think that was the case. I, it makes sense to me. Yeah. I haven't like explored the topic as deeply as, you know, people like George Selgin, for example, mm -hmm. or uh, Lawrence White, who are, you know, some of the main free banking proponents these days. And also, uh, they're, they're minor characters in the Genesis book as well. Um, but at least intuitive, intuitively, I think that makes sense. Uh, I think intuitively, free banking should align the incentives correctly, at least, um, which is, you know, kind of the most important thing is to align incentives in the right way. Um, but I, I don't know. I, again, I've looked into it briefly, but now it, you know, some people have studied this for years and yeah. have a lot more to say on this topic than I, than I do. But in either case, the solution was not deregulation. The solution that was implemented back then was the Federal Reserve. Um, and so, and the, but the Federal Reserve quickly started to expand its mandate, essentially. So rather than just acting as a lender of last resort, they also started to take up the mantle of you know, kind of planning the economy, at least the monetary part, part of that. Yeah. So around this time, and we're still talking about early 20th century, there was a movement called the Stable Money Association. Mm -hmm. And they believed that money was best, uh, the money s functioned best if prices remained stable over time. So they, they thought if the economy is going to self-organize through a free market, then you know, products and services need to have a stable price. Uh, specifically, what they proposed was a uh, using the CPI for that, the Consumer Price Index, which is indeed still used today. So you sort of take a basket of goods and services that people generally buy, and then you take an average of that, and that average needs to be stable over time. So in that basket of goods, it might include potatoes and it might include carrots, and maybe in one year the potatoes are a bit more expensive than carrots and then the next year the carrots are a bit more expensive than potatoes but the average is still the same and that's how you determine okay then prices are stable now Which, there's already a problem with this because who gets to decide this who gets to decide what's in the basket well, i was going to say that you know we do it a little different here in the u.s we just take stuff out if it makes the government look bad so we just change it around every year and then you know from like 15 years ago to what it is today, it's just completely different, right? Yeah. You know, if like the most important things people need, like gas or food or whatever, like to survive, we just take those things out of the equation because that would make the government look bad. Yeah. That would make it obvious that they're just stealing from everybody. A That's good it. example of this is also uh, housing prices. So housing <laughs> prices is obviously a major expense for everyone. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the biggest expense many people make in their lives. And you pay it off for, you know, a good chunk of your life. Uh, if you took a mortgage, but it's not included in the consumer price index because the consumer price index fo focuses on consumer prices and a home is seen as an investment rather than something you consume, or at least that's the argument they give. But 
you know the the biggest expense in your life is not included in the CPI, which to me sounds crazy. It's absurd. Yeah, I mean that that's like the first thing you should include. I was reading something the other day when the CPI came in. I think it was some kind of you know common thing that everybody you know consumes, right? Like coffee or something like that. Like went through the roof, so they just like took it out because it would make them look bad. <laughs> Yeah, so there's so there there's some weird arguments. Uh, there's some weird logic when it comes to um, designing the CPI. But in any case, wh- whatever, wh- however the CPI uh, CPI is calculated, it is sort of centrally determined what's actually in the CPI. There's, yeah. you know, there's a group of uh, you know experts. I'll say in quote marks. I'll do the actual Ex- quote marks. Experts. Yeah, experts. and they decide what the CPI looks like. Uh, but anyways, the, the point was to create stable pl- uh, prices. Uh, and the way to do that was by affecting uh, or manipulating the interest rate. So the Federal Reserve, if prices were, i got to say it the right way around, if prices were falling, they would uh, decrease the interest rate so people would be more incentivized to borrow and spend, pumping prices up. And if prices were rising, they would increase interest rates to, you know, limit the amount of uh, borrowing that was going on and prices would go down. And that's how they would keep it stable. So Hayek had sort of two big issues with it. So one of them was that this manipulating of interest rates distorts the economy in itself. But he also didn't really believe in this whole stable price concept itself. Yeah, yeah. Because he thought, actually, deflation is the natural state of the economy. Mm -hmm. Actually... So there's two types of deflation, I should point out here. So deflation is when prices drop. Now, prices can drop for two reasons. Prices can drop because the amount of money in circulation decreases. There's just less money. There's not as much money as before. And Hayek believed, argued, or agreed with other economists that this was bad. Like, that's a bad thing. If the money supply drops, and that's why we have deflation... That's bad. That can lead to a deflationary debt cycle because that's uh, producers are making less money. They have to make layoffs, and then people can spend even less money. That like that, and, and this is a cycle that's bad. Mm-hmm. But he also argues, if prices drop because production becomes more efficient and cheaper, that's natural. That's normal. Like if if there's more automation in the economy, if uh, manual labor, so you have the subjective uh, theory of value and the labor theory of value. So the labor theory of value, that that's the point that value ultimately comes from the labor people, which is put just in. absurd because you know you can have you know two people working just as hard on a thing, and you know obviously maybe one thing is wildly people prefer it much more, you know, and they put the same amount of labor into two different things, you know, one individual over here and one individual over here, and yeah. somebody invented something that everybody uses, and then. Somebody invented something that nobody wants, right? So yeah. you can't just say, hey, you know, <laughs> it's the same. Right? Exactly. If uh, prices decrease because production just becomes cheaper, cheaper and more efficient. Which is the that, natural state of being yes. because society, technology, everything gets better, right? right. So these, these goods right. that are the easiest to produce like food and, um, you know, all those types of things. Over time, we should just, our manufacturing processes, everything should get better, right? And we have more people. So, you know, the... The sellers of these goods can make the, the, the price might come down because it's easier and they're more efficient, but they're selling to more people as time goes on, right? Um, so the natural state is, like you said, it, it's these things are the the cost to produce them is going down. So why should those prices be stable, right? Um, and, exactly. You know. Yes. And ultimately, that benefits the poorest people who really need those things to survive. I think so. Um, uh, I'm, yeah, I would say it benefits everyone, benefits and, and you can turn sure, it and you sure. can turn it around. Yeah. If you keep prices stable, that needs that means there needs to be more money in the economy. Who does that benefit? Yeah, the wealthiest, right? You know, because they get to print the new money first. They can access the new money first, and you know, we can we can discuss. We can go into the Cantillon effect a lot later, but yeah, uh, it's whoever is closest to the source of the money benefits ex- from that. Exactly. Right. Which of course they get to is, spend it first. Is in big part the government, the government, and then you know these huge yeah. banks that get to. Be the first lenders, yes, right? they get, exactly. and then they can lend it to the smaller exactly. banks, and then they benefit. And really, at the end of the day, it's the poorest people who are the last to react, who really need their salaries. The salaries and wages are the last thing to sort of adjust up when in this vicious cycle. Um, Paul, can you pull up shadow stats? Because I just think it's funny that um, you're talking about the, this concept of a CPI, um, and 
you know, this whole the stable money association, but this the CPI itself has changed so much over time that it's like even the CPI is not stable. I mean, right. adding and removing things and adjusting things. And I mean, to an to extent, that makes sense, though, of course, right? <laughs> like so. 20 years ago, there couldn't be smartphones in the CPI. True. But true. these days, there have to be smartphones in the CP CPI. So it, make it, it makes it does have to be adjusted. Uh -huh. That that does make sense. But it just it, seems it's like about who decides what is uh, included and not. And like it just seems like the adjustments are always made to benefit whoever is in power at the time and wants to push out a certain narrative. I mean, I guess that's the way I've. I mean, sort of well, definitely when the this is actually something I do reference in the book when the when the housing prices were taken out. That was definitely to kind of mask. Yeah. Um, the real inflation numbers. Uh, the, yeah. You know, this, like when I first heard this, it sounds like maybe conspiratorial, but no, this is actually a legitimate, you oh, know, yeah. the economist reported on this, or right. I think that was my source for this. Like it, it, it this is a, I think a very true thing. Yeah. I think this is a really good website, shadowstats.com, um, John Williams. And I think he just, he publishes like the, older metrics of how they evaluated things and compared them to right. today, how they are saying the CPI. And it's like, yeah, it's interesting. The inflation, according to the old statistics is way higher. So it just makes sense if you think about it. And Hayek predicted this as well, when it comes to, you know, counter cyclical government spending, it's like the incentive is always to try to make whoever's in power look good. And I think, you know, it's hard to like, to your point, you know, yes, things need to be added and, you know, subtracted over time, but you know, when you take 30 years ago or 50 years ago, 30, however long ago, and you look at it and compare it today, it's like, <laughs> it's such a big right. difference. And I mean, it's just, you know, it kind of tells a completely different narrative. We kind of talked about moral hazard. Um, we talked about the Fed a little bit. And in your opinion, do you think, because this idea of a lender of last resort, independently from all the other roles the Fed took on, and just in your personal opinion, do you think that the Fed could exist just as a lender of last resort if that was its only role? You know, I, I mean, I think it's good. Technically, you could implement a Federal Reserve like that, mm -hmm. but that doesn't do away with the moral hazard issue. Okay. Um, and I think that's you know that's also a big problem. I think it, you know in an economy, in a healthy economy, reward and risk are matched. Mm -hmm. So if you take the risk, you get the reward. If it turns out well, and if it doesn't, then, you know, you took the risk, you get, it, it's your problem. And yeah. there's other people's, so the problem with, with having the Federal do, uh, federal Reserve or any central bank doing this is if they would have to, uh, you know, bail out failing bank, essentially, by creating new money, then everyone else who's holding money, their money is being debased, yeah. right? So there's a group of people that has money in a bank and then that bank goes belly up uh -huh. without the federal reserve or without the central bank then the people who had that money in that bank mm -hmm. they're you know they're out of luck they lost their money but they put their money in that bank yeah they they trusted that bank it was their own choice to put their money in that bank personal responsibility right? exactly <clears throat> while if you have a federal reserve to bank that to build that bank out well now these people get their money back but it's paid for through inflation, essentially. So now everyone else is paying for that. So in the first model, these people have personal responsibility and have an incentive to actually find a, a safe bank, a responsible bank. Yeah. And in the second model, that that responsibility is you know socialized, essentially, which means that no one has to do you know research what kind of bank they're using, and anyone can just. Go and this in overall, like if the market can't figure out which banks are safe or not, doesn't have to figure it out. Well, as a result, I think all banks will be be less safe. All all banks will be more reckless. Uh, will be taking too many risks because it does make you, sense because there's you know there's no sort of market demand for banks that don't do that. So the incentives just don't align if you have a federal reserve that you know bills I've banks always wondered they need too to. if there's like a, if there could be like the FDIC how they have this insurance on individual accounts up to a certain amount for individuals. I wonder if there's a free market solution for that, you know, to some kind of insurance on bank deposits. Yeah, of course. No, I mean, that, that obviously you can have a free market figure out a insurance type of system. That's I mean, what I was thinking too. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, that's, that, that's, that, that would be the, the outcome, I think in that case, like that, because people don't want to personally 
uh, research if their bank is safe. But you know, that's where insurance companies come in, and you know, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah, no doubt. You know, Hayek predicted even with the creation of the Fed that you know there's going to be big failures anyway. And uh, I think after the Great Depression, and that was largely proven to be correct that even with the Federal Reserve, yeah, even with the lender of last resort, the moral hazard was so high that. Um, to his credit, banks still failed. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Well, so the business cycle, that's uh, the, uh, that's what I touched on earlier. That's with the manipulation of interest rate. If you if you have artificially low interest rates, then uh, producers will cr- produce more than the actual demand will be in the future because you know, the interest rate manipulation, it, it's the wrong, they're getting the wrong signal from the market. And indeed, this is, is essentially what happened in the 20s. Until uh, until uh, it all ended with the uh, with the Wall Street crash in 1929. yeah, and then the Great Depression, which uh, happened after. So at that point, the question is, or was like in that time, the the 30s, the question was, well, how do you now deal with this situation? Okay. You know, if there's so many, uh, if there's such high unemployment and uh, the, the stock market crash and everything, like how do you move forward from here. And Hayek's argument was, well, let let the free market sort it out at this point. Like the reason that this happened was through manipulating interest yeah. rates. Now, if we just let the free market do its thing, then it's going to be painful. Uh, it's it's going to be a hard time for everyone. But actually, the economy is returning to... It's natural it, state. It's natural state. It, it's returning to, to, to reality, mm-hmm. if you will. So let's so. let's go back just a little bit. You know, before the, the advent of the Federal Reserve, the idea was to prevent the natural business cycle, or is the Austrian business cycle just the natural cycle, or is the Austrian business cycle describing what happens after the Fed came into being and started doing all this print money printing, et cetera? Because before, there was, um, you know, natural booms and busts kind of cycle, and was nowhere near as bad as what was right. the depression created. I mean, that's just the natural state of the economy, right? You know, there's going to be uh, investments and some of it's not going to pan out. There's going to be risk taking. That's part of a free market. Yeah. We talk about an Austrian business cycle. Mm-hmm. Is that the same? Is that like describing just the normal business cycle or is the Austrian business cycle specifically discussing what happens when the Fed came into being and was Hayek's prediction? Um, as I understand it anyways, that the business cycle that I described, that, that refers to the interest rates changing okay. based on subjective needs from people. Mm-hmm. You know, if they want to, their time preference, essentially, do, yeah. do they want to buy something now or would they prefer to invest their money? And that informing producers in which stage of the production process they should invest and that sort of matching with um, yeah, the, what the economy needs. So again, with lower interest rates because there's more um, people are more willing to de- delay their purchase. So now inv- companies can invest in their production process, and then by the time that this is improved and people people get their money back and they have the additional interest rate to actually purchase what they want. So, the so Fed this is distorted by the Fed. By, by yeah by manipulating interest okay. rates, and that's how, for example, you got to the Great Depression. Hayek argues. Gotcha. Makes a lot of sense there. That brings me to a, a more philosophical a philosophical question that, you know, I kind of always ask myself and, you know, we saw this with, we saw this with the COVID where, you know, the government is trying to do all these different things. And it's always trying to, you know, just do something, right? Why does something, why does it seem like something always has, people always want to do something, but sometimes the best solution is just let, let things play out. And I think that was Hayek's argument. Um, and sadly, it just didn't resonate with people, right? Because this idea of, you know, John Maynard Keynes and socialism um, and all these other concepts, they seem to always win out the argument at the end of the day. It's, it's almost like it's very unpopular to just kind of say like, hey, like let things fix themselves. Time will, will solve these problems. And, you know, we don't have to try to do all these crazy things. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that philosophical idea? Um, well, okay. As it comes to my personal beliefs, so I believe I, I largely agree with uh, Hayek and Austrians, and that that that's the best way to approach the economy. Yeah. But even Hayek did see that there were exceptions to this rule. Essentially, mm-hmm. like it's not always true that leaving things to the free market is the best way uh, to do it. So there are exceptions to the rule. So uh, a good example of this is maybe the fire department. Mm-hmm. Like if you uh, privatize it entirely, that's actually worse for everyone 
Because if your neighbor is not insured with the private fire department and his house catches on fire, mm -hmm. now you have a problem as well. Yeah. Right? While if there is a socialized or a public fire department, as is the case in even in, in uh, the United States, right, which is a fairly uh, free market-based country, um, then if your neighbor's house catches on fire, they put it out and you're, you stay out of trouble. trouble. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it prevents bigger problems if you socialize some things the big question is like where the tragedy of the commons and you know, yeah things. exactly so there are so my general philosophy is start out with the free market mm -hmm. like that's the way that that's the best way to organize the economy that's yeah. as a as a general rule that is how you want to organize society but it, there are exceptions to that rule and you need to also be mindful of these exceptions like it doesn't make Let's say in this example with a privatized fire department, it would essentially mean that if you do want to be insured, you have to pay a lot because the risk of your house catching fire is also higher because your neighbors aren't insured. Mm -hmm. So now you're paying a lot. Well, if you socialize the fire department, then you kind of, it's actually cheaper for everyone and safer for everyone. Mm -hmm. So there are exceptions to the rules. So start out with free markets. That's the best way to do it. That's, you know, let the free market figure out how to allocate resources across the economy. Um, but, you know, figure out, you know, where there are the exceptions to this rule. Yeah, yeah the tragedy of the commons, uh, that, that's another argument. Um, like there's an argument to be made that uh, natural parks are good and, and there's no, the, the only way to sort of protect that is to say, okay, you can't, you know, we're, we're going to have to sort of maintain this because no one has the incentive to do there's it. There's no financial that. incentive. Yeah. So many problems you can, you know, if there's a financial incentive, the free market is great at solving. Yes, problem. exactly. So that's, that's the important thing. So, and, and Hayek as well, he, he, especially later in his life. So he started out very free minded or a free market minded. But then throughout his life, he did uh, sort of start to write about where there are exceptions to this rule. And I think Hayek had a pretty realistic take on this personally. Interesting. Yeah. I've thought about this a lot, actually, um, when it comes to certain things like, for example, the prison system here in the U.S., right? So right now the incentive is, it seems like the private prison system is, is largely a failure in a lot of ways. But um, if there was a way to realign those incentives somehow, right, because, you know, ultimately we want... Right now, it's like, hey, how much, how can we save as much money as possible and extract as much money as possible from the government or whatever if you're a private prison? Right. right. But um, if you could somehow align the financial incentive to like, hey, your inmates, you know, we're going to pay you more if they don't, you know, I think it's called recidivism, if they don't, you know, re-commit uh, a crime, right? Mm. So you work on, instead now the incentive is, hey, you get a big bonus payout if, you know, based on your percentage of, of inmates that actually, you know, reoffend, right? If right. The lower it is, the more we're going to pay you. I feel like, you know, there's some potential there to realign the financial incentive where to allow free markets to work better on some of these issues, especially. Yeah. And with private prisons, <clears throat> the prison system or the prison, uh, you know, companies, <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they also have an incentive, of course, to just have more inmates, right? Yeah. Which, you know, they by could, the inmates. Could, they could, don't necessarily get paid by the, and, you know. Well, yeah, and that could potentially influence, you know, campaign funding and sort of to indirectly get more inmates to, you know, mm -hmm. change laws or so. Yeah. I would say that's another good example where I would not make that a private uh, business, yeah. uh, prisons. I think that's that's probably not how incentives align in the best interest of society. I think you're probably right, yeah. I mean, unless you can, like I said, figure out a way to make the final yeah, that, incentive. About yeah, in general, yeah, again, that's ideal. Like, the free market is the best solution unless it's not. Yeah. <laughs> that's sort of my, my <laughs> one sentence uh, idea. And Hayek, Hayek had a similar idea. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about John Maynard Keynes. Mm, uh, yeah. yeah, so I was talking about the Great Repression and that people needed to figure out or want, they needed a solution. And Hayek said, well, the best solution is just, just let the free market figure it out. And it's going to be painful and it's going to take a while. But at least when the free market has figured it out, it's figured out. And then you can sort of start growing the economy again in a healthy, um, uh, productive way. Uh, the fix, the, fix the problems, stop manipulating interest rates, etc. That's That's the best way forward. 
But this idea was very unpopular because it's so painful. Yeah. You, you know, people are out of a job and they, they you know, it's crisis. That was like my, that was kind of my question, which was, you know, why do people always feel that something has to be done? Because obviously Keen's ideas won out right. in the end, you know, largely with the public. Right. But it's, that, that's kind of what I was asking is like, yeah. why do you think that, you know. Well, yeah, it's more, it sounds better, right? <laughs> it sounds better if someone says, I have a solution. Yes. So yes. Keen said, I have a solution. And his solution was that, so he, first of all, he kind of ignored the whole reason why the the crisis happened, or at least he ignored Hayek's explanation. And instead he said, well, this is just a normal part of an economy. It's animal spirits, as he yeah, described animal it. animal spirits. Yeah, uh, th there will just be uh, downturns like this. It happens. But to prevent it, or the best way to deal with it, is now the government needs to step in. So now in this downturn, that's the time for the government to start investing in the economy, start building bridges, infrastructure, get people to work in a way that serves the public good. Uh -huh. Then, I mean, that does sound great. I mean, it, I mean that, for me, it's like when I heard that, I'm like, you know what? It, it does make sense, right? Like if the government is going to spend money on public projects, why not do it when the market is in a, in a bad state? Like yes. that's the time to deploy the capital. Right. I mean, I don't think that in itself is a bad idea, actually. Yeah. Like that makes sense. If... If the government is at any time going to spend any money, like yeah. that's the time to do it, essentially, yes, right? Exactly. Like that that would be the best way for the government to to manage that. Uh, so that was also Keynes' idea. And then when the economy starts picking up again, like people yeah. people have an income because they help build a bridge. Mm -hmm. Now they're building potato or they're buying potatoes. So the potato farmer has an income. He's buying clothes. Like yeah. the economy gets rolling again. That's when the government should step back again. Yeah, I agree. Now, here we get in the problem. This idea of counter-cyclical. Uh, yeah, so this is the counter-cyclical approach. Now, here's the problem with that. As Hayek pointed out, Hayek said, just like you said and I just said, it actually sounds pretty good in theory. Mm -hmm. The problem is you need a government to do it. Yeah. And how, so now you need the government to say when the economy is in an upswing and when the economy is in a downturn. The problem with that is that it's always going to be more popular, or at least that was his argument. It's always going to be more popular for the government to, to invest money in the economy. So people will always tell the, the government, hey, we're not doing great. We need to do better. Please use your powers to spend this money now. So while Keynes's idea sounds nice in theory, Hayek said in a, in a democracy, at least, people are going to have a demand for the government to just spend money because, it, you know, it, it benefits at least in the short term, it benefits people, you know, there's more jobs. Um, so so, the, so they'll just always want the government to do this. There, there's no sort of mechanism that enforces this counter-cyclical. Yeah. In, um, in fact, the game theory and the incentives, you know, are just aligned with yeah. always spending and always trying to be popular because you're trying to be reelected as a politician. Ex right? so exactly. Yeah. To quote so. directly from your book to what Hayek exactly said. There will always be sections of the country or population groups that consider themselves sufficiently hard pressed <laughs> to be entitled to support. Can a rational counter cyclical policy under these circumstances be devised if it is entrusted to political bodies? For Hayek, the answer was a resounding no. And I think it's it's a nail on the head, right? And we've seen that play out. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, the, yeah, so his problem with Keynes' idea, and by the way, it's uh, Keynes and Hayek, so they had this big debate on this topic, uh, both publicly and privately. They knew each other. They were both working at British universities. Um, and they uh, they were actually friendly, uh, at least on a personal level. Like, they knew each other. Um, but, yeah, they had this fierce disagreement on how the economy should be managed, where Hayek had this strong idea of bottom-up spontaneous order, Keynes took this top-down approach. He said the government has a big role in managing the economy. So this became sort of a, you know, it became one of the big debates of the 20th century, at least in the field of economics. And, um, uh, and, and they were really sort of opposing forces in that sense. You know, there's this famous rap battle of history. Have you seen that? With yeah. Hayek and Keynes? Or, or at least a, because... And, yeah, the rap battles of history might be something else. Like that's a separate YouTube channel, but yeah. they they have two famous rap battles as well, and uh, and they're really good actually. They like they really touch on all the important issues, and they really they're do. they're so well produced. They have and one. every everything about it is great. Even they have one about like the, the, the Federal Reserve and 
You know what I'm talking about? One as well with, I think it's... Uh, they have two versions with the Hayek and Keynes for battles. There's Hayek and Keynes, but there's also um, Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton. Oh, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that as well. I don't, I don't remember that so vividly, but mm -hmm. I, I have seen it at some point. But yeah, these rap battles are like way better than they deserve to be. <laughs> they're, they're so good. Like I, basically, the the rap battle. Like if you don't feel like reading the first chapter of my book, just watch the rap battle. <laughs> you get a, you get a pretty good idea, anyways. Let's discuss the stabilizers just a little bit more um, in this idea kind of what Hayek thought about that and also what how what Keynes thought about that and how that sort of plays into these different competing ideas yeah sure I mean the, so the stabilizers as mentioned by Irving that the start with Irving Fisher and they had this idea that the, the the money should be stable so the prices should not fluctuate too much over time that that was the best way for the economy to self-organize to have a stable or, or stable in air quotes um uh, yeah prices for all, at least on average for goods and services is there another rabbit hole you want to dive in there or well you know we're gonna we're gonna discuss probably in the next episode more about this idea of like of money and you know what is money and mm -hmm. you know different ideas for money whether it be gold backed or you know, fiat um so i don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole but let's just let's just kind of close out this section, maybe talking a little bit more about FDR, um, the New Deal, how that really put Keynes on, you know, how the response to the excess of what the Fed initially did in the Roaring Twenties and how FDR took Keynes's ideas and, and really played them out. Yeah, well, it the, it's not uh, super obvious that FDR was directly influenced by Keynes because he was already... So, he, yeah, his idea was very similar. Mm -hmm. He said um, he also had this idea the Great Depression was happening and he said the best way to get out of this and if I am elected as president, then the way we will get out of this is by increasing spending. So we're going to spend the economy. Uh, we're going to spend uh, our way out of this recession, essentially. And uh, obviously, this is very similar to what Keynes was saying. And he also endorsed this idea. So indeed, this, these sort of Keynesian ideas were taking hold. Now, they were not... So it's not obvious that FDR was, was like specifically, concretely inspired by Keynes in the first place. But Keynes did offer the sort of framework to... Uh, the, the sort of the academic framework for, okay, this is why what FDR is doing makes sense and why it's a good thing. And Hayek obviously rejected this idea. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Hayek believed that just let the free market do its thing. That's the best way for it, mm -hmm. forward. Um, and, and especially indeed because you can't trust the government to to reverse the spending spree when the economy is starting to pick up again. Now, it's inter one interesting question is that I'll just throw out there. Um, Let's say that you, let's say that we'd have a money with a fixed supply. In that case, maybe Keynesianism wouldn't even be that bad. So I w I'm not going so far as to say I'm an advocate for it. Mm -hmm. But if you ha do have a fixed supply, then the government is really forced to revert its spending program, uh, program yeah. at some point. Uh -huh. So it does put sort of this hard stop on what the government can do. It can't just... There's a check uh, on that power. Yes, exa exactly. So, excess. yeah, so I think it's probably still a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But at least in that world, the idea would not be as bad as in a world where the government can also just print money. Yeah. Because if the government can also print money, well, then they can just keep on their spending spree forever. Mm -hmm. There's really nothing that stops them from just you know, pretending like the economy is still in the downturn and keeping to, uh, you know, invest uh, in, in more infrastructure. But if there is a hard limit on money, then at least they can't do it forever. Like there is actually a real hard stop mm -hmm. on um, on how far they can go. And as we agreed on earlier, it does sound like it makes sense that if the government's going to spend it all, it should do it so in a downturn. Yeah. So I'm not. Uh, it's not obvious to me that this is the that this is how it should be done. Uh, but it's it's at least interesting to consider that Keynesian ideas maybe would be less harmful in the world with hard money. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting thought. Very interesting thought. 
<clears throat> so all this stuff we're talking about, and again, you know, you, you go to, at least here in America, you go to school and you study and like, you know, this is like, what we're talking about is like sacrilegious almost. Cause like what they tell you in the textbook, what I remember reading is like FDR is a hero. You know, the new deal was like the best thing ever, you know, the government printing money, doing all this stuff, you know, is just, it's amazing. Right. And of course, you know, that's the education. Probably most of our listeners have, if you're in America, right. That's, that's what you've been, that's what you've been taught in public school. Mm. That's what you've been taught in public education. Yeah. What would you say to that? You know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, um, I mean, in, in the Netherlands where I'm from, it's it's not that different, of course. It's uh, in general very Keynesian, uh, and I think it's I, I think it's obviously bad. Yeah, I think the right way to do it is to at least show different perspectives. Absolutely. Like I think it's especially it's more true for economics than in any other, at least social science that sort of one perspective is picked and that's what everyone is taught. Uh Um, While I think the right way to do it is to at least show the different ways that people are thinking about this. So if you want to teach Keynesian economics, I don't have a problem with that in itself, but Mm -hmm. also teach Austrian economics, also teach monetarist economics, and then let people sort of think for themselves and figure it out and consider the different ways, the different ways that you can look at these. Mm -hmm. Kind of issues. I don't think the Austrian economics are even mentioned. No, it's same in the Netherlands for sure not. I've, yeah. I've, I don't think I heard about it before I came across Bitcoin. That is wild, isn't it? Yeah, that is truly wild. Yeah, I mean, I may have heard about Hayek at some point. He he is sort of the most mainstream accepted of the Austrian economists. Uh-huh. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize or Nobel. It wasn't the, the actual. It was the Nobel Prize for economics, which is sort of a fake Nobel Prize, but still he won that one at least and that, you know, it has prestige. Um, so he's semi accepted uh, in mainstream, but um, other Austrian economics economists are just completely ignored. And that way of thinking about the economy is it's basically non-existent, at least in, at least in my experience going to school and, you know, even uh, studying a bit of economics at some point yeah. in university. And it, it was just not not discussed, basically. Yeah, no, I think that's crazy. I mean, it should at least be considered as it should at least be presented as a view to consider. Yeah, I mean, it's at the very least. And but I think Bitcoin is definitely changing that. I mean, we're doing this podcast, and people are really dis- rediscovering uh, these economists and their work and this way of thinking about the economy. And I think that's uh, very it's very interesting that Bitcoin is actually sort of trying to or starting to achieve this. I hadn't even heard of Austrian economics really until, you know, I found Bitcoin. You know, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, same for me. <laughs> um, until I think, you know, this might have been one of the first quotes I read that, uh, you know, when I when I became orange pilled and went down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and money. And that can this can kind of segue us into our, our very next uh, you know episode or, or discussion, which is um, a quote by Hayek that says, I don't believe that we shall ever have a good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of government. Since we can't take them violently out of the hands of government, all we can do is by some sly roundabout way, introduce something that can't stop. Friedrich Hayek, 1984. Yeah, that's the opening quote of uh, the Genesis book. And I think it, it perfectly encapsulates sort of the contents of the book as well. I agree. Like, as I mentioned at the start of the episode, it, it's sort of this, um, it's where monetary reform and uh, technology meets, uh, you know, the two storylines in the book and, and Hayek. Yeah. So the only way to achieve monetary reform is to create something the government can stop. And that's sort of the technical side that these techies were building tools that governments can stop and these together. That's, that's what Bitcoin is. And this will take us to our next episode where we discuss the idea of neutral money and money in general. Looking forward to it.